Well, good morning. It's a real honor for me to be here. Uh, I have heard of the Homewood Church for most of my ministry, but I've never been here. I haven't been to Birmingham in 50 years, I told the guys yesterday. So to actually get to see uh, the church building, to be with you, is a real honor for me. Uh, I have uh, known of Rick Caulfield for many, many years. He's held in such high esteem in the circles in which I move for being such a faithful, effective minister. And then I love your preacher. Every time I'm around Brett, I just want to be a better man. And I hope you're taking really, really good care of him. So it's an honor to stand in your pulpit. It's an honor to be here. And you know, one nice thing about being here, uh, most places I go, I have to tell people, uh, I'm not speaking in tongues. This is a Texas accent. And I have to ask for someone to do interpretation. But I'm thinking most of you from Alabama, you can get it and you know what I'm saying, so we don't have to do that today, and that's nice too. Uh, one thing about me is uh, I love to play golf. I'm not a particularly good golfer, but it's always been my pastime, my hobby, and my passion. In fact, I've had the privilege of playing some of the great Robert Trent Jones courses here in Alabama. Uh, and so I had a thrill of a lifetime a few years ago, there is a professional golf tournament in my city of Fort Worth, Texas called the Colonial. And the greatest golfers in the world come every year and play that tournament. And I have a friend in my church who is the producer of golf for CBS Sports. So when you watch the Masters, every scene you're seeing, he's in the truck making that call. He got me a spot in the Pro-Am that year for the Colonial. Now, if you don't know what that is, Every uh, tournament, the pros on the day before it starts play a round of golf with spares like me. And we get to go behind the ropes and play the real golf course with real pro golfers. And it's expensive. I've never tried to do it, but I was given a, one of the CBS spots and I got to play. So I'm really excited. I am going to be behind the ropes. I'm going to be playing on a real golf course with lots of people watching, but then I got nervous because here's the thing about my golf game. There's a, a shot in golf, it's called the bunker shot or the sand shot. I've never been good at it. Now here's the thing, it's totally mental. I've played enough golf by now, I should know how to hit that shot. But I have in my memory banks all the times I totally failed and I walk into the trap thinking I'll fail again. And so I just dread that moment. So my prayer to God was, Please don't let me go into a bunker when I play this round of golf in the Pro-Am. And God heard my prayer for six holes. <laughs> On the seventh hole, I knocked my tee shot into the trees. I actually hit a really good shot from there all the way down to the green, but it rolled into a bunker. Now, this was a big, deep bunker, about 10 feet deep. And so when I get down into the bunker, all I can see is the top of the flagstick. And there are... Hundreds of people sitting in bleachers all around watching me about to do the worst thing I do in golf. And I thought to myself as I walked down there, this is going to be a total fail. So I'm just going to hit once, probably not even get out, pick up my ball, walk in shame to the next tee. I swung, the ball took off, I heard clank, and hundreds of people stood up and went nuts. I knocked the ball in the hole on the fly. I have never done that in my life. So, in that moment, what did I do? Did I shrug my shoulders and grin sheepishly and say, well, that was lucky. Are you kidding me? I strutted up to that green like, well, of course I went in the hole. That's where I was aiming. Because everybody was clapping for me. And here's the thing about applause. Applause is so captivating. And then... It can take you captive. And so uh, a few years ago on Easter weekend, I preached a sermon at my church on the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And if you recall that story in John 11, Jesus said three things. He said, remove the stone. And that's a word of hope. Then Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And that's a word of life. That's not the last thing Jesus said. The last thing Jesus said was, take the grave clothes off him. And that's a word of freedom. And so I asked my church, is it possible 
that you have received supernatural resurrection life from Christ as a Christian. But you're still walking in the bondage of the old life. You're not enjoying the freedom of your new life because you're still wearing those old grave clothes. And I passed out to everyone cards. And I said, I want you to write on your card the area of your life where you feel like you are dealing with some level of bondage. And I got several thousand cards back. And I read every single one of them. Because I wanted to know where are the areas in my own church where people aren't enjoying their freedom in Christ. And, and I sorted them into five major areas that I wanted to address in future sermons. Number five was anger and bitterness. Many cards that said, something happened to me in my past and I can't let go of it. And I can't walk in joy in the present because I'm still in bondage to what happened in my past. Area number four was financial bondage. So many people said, I, I cannot walk in freedom in Christ because of all the debt I'm in or even because I find my worth in what I own. When I need a boost of self-esteem, I go shop and I'm in bondage. Area number three was sexual sin. Especially men, especially pornography. It is an absolute epidemic in our churches. And sadly, we're afraid to talk about it. Our churches are full of men living in bondage. And they won't tell anybody. Area number two, I thought, would be area number one. Fear and worry. Card after card that said, I am so afraid of tomorrow. What if the cancer doesn't go into remission? What if they downsize at work? What if my children never return to the faith? And so many people said, I am so worried about tomorrow, I can't walk in freedom today. But the number one fear of my church caught me by surprise. I didn't see it coming. More cards than any other said something like this. I'm so sick of living for the approval of other people. I don't like myself. I don't feel good about myself. I'm so tired of being a people pleaser. Now the Bible calls that the fear of man. And when you read that phrase in the Bible, the fear of man, it's not talking about your fear that someone might physically harm you. It is talking about the kind of bondage we live in when we need other people to tell us we can feel okay about ourselves. You have a proverb 29 verse 23. Fear of man will prove to be a snare. Or in a, the same uh, verse in another translation, fearing people is a dangerous trap. Another, being afraid of people can get you into trouble. And finally, another, don't fall into the trap of being a coward. You cannot live free if other people are telling you who you will be. People pleasing is bondage. But who among us has not felt the weight of that chain? Here's what I've learned. Everybody struggles with approval addiction. We all have this overwhelming desire to be accepted by others. Or to put it another way, we really like to be liked. In fact, we get on our devices every day to check how many likes we got. And the desire to be liked can absolutely overwhelm the desire to be right. Now what I just said was really important, so I'm going to say it again. Our desire to be liked is so strong, 
it can overwhelm our desire to be right. A classic illustration here, there was a famous study at a university some years back who wanted to study the power of peer pressure in young people. So they would take 10 young people and put them in a room. Ages first grade up to seniors in high school, six year old up to about 18. And the test seemed simple enough. A teacher would walk in and draw three lines on a board, a real long line, medium sized line, and a very short line. And the assignment was simple enough. Hold up your hand when the teacher points to the longest line. But here's what the 10th student didn't know. The nine had been told ahead of time, hold up your hand when the teacher points to the second longest line. So that 10th student comes in and doesn't know. The teacher points to what is clearly the longest line. Every time that kid would hold up the hand and then look around the room and see that nobody else has their hand up. 75% of the time, they'd pull that hand back down. Now we're talking six-year-old all the way to 18-year-old. They would clearly rather be wrong than be right if it meant they stood out from the crowd. And that's the power of approval addiction. And it comes at a high price. It comes at the pressure to conform our values. It, it causes us to be unwilling to risk intimacy. Am I going to let you know who I really am if I fear you aren't going to approve or accept me? Which then leads to uh, feeling uh, a lack of self-esteem because I go through so much of my life faking and pretending to impress people and then ultimately I, I just lose the willpower to stand with the few against the many. Think about it. So many of our what was I thinking moments were driven by approval addiction. Why did you laugh at that joke? It was clearly racist. But everybody else laughed. You didn't want to stand out. Why does that guy work 70, 80 hours a week and ignore his family? Is it because he doesn't love his family? No. It's because the culture says your self-worth is determined by your net worth and he is so driven for people in the marketplace to think he's a success. That's what's driving him. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with a young woman who got up that morning in the bed of another strange man. And she feels lousy and she feels dirty. Why? Because the night before, she so desperately needed to hear some man say, I care about you, even if she knew he was lying. Now, before I take the speck out of your eye, I need to take the log out of mine. I am a recovering approval addict. By the way, most ministers are. One of the reasons we get into ministry is because we like people. And we like to be liked by people. I've known about this for a long time. So here's the thing. I'm in the third grade. I was never the coolest kid in school, ever. I was never fast. I was never super athletic. You know what my label was in school? The smart kid. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's what the kids call me. He's the smart kid. That does not put you up at highest on the ladder of cool, okay? But I wasn't at the bottom. In third grade, in our class, the girl at the bottom was named Connie. Connie was a little socially awkward. She was overweight. 
and she really struggled in school. I'll bet anything she had learning disabilities. But we didn't know much about that back then. We just called her the dumb girl. So we played this game at math time in third grade. The teacher would hold up flashcards. You would stand up next to someone's desk. And, and whoever got the answer right first would go to the next desk. Whoever got all the way back around the room to their desk would win a donut. I usually won. I was the smart kid. So this day the teacher says, Rick, we will start with you. Pick someone to begin the game. And I looked across the room. And all the popular cool kids, they all gave me the same look. Don't pick me. And I thought, well, who am I going to pick? And then it hit me. There's one person I can pick. And nobody will mind. So I said, I picked Connie. And everybody in class laughed. Because they knew she had no chance and she didn't. So I stood by Connie's desk and she stood up and the teacher showed the card. I had the answer before she could read the question. Everybody laughed again. And Connie sat down. Now people, this is over 50 years ago. I can still remember looking into her eyes. And her eyes didn't say... I hate you. They said, why did you hurt me? I thought you were one of the nice boys. And in that moment, it dawned on me. My sick desire to be liked can turn me into somebody I don't like. Most of us don't struggle with being wicked. We struggle with being wimpy. And where courage is absent, bondage is always present. Because here's the thing. Nobody wins the people-pleasing race. Okay? You're never going to find happiness trying to keep everybody happy. If you have entered the people-pleasing race, here's what you're doing. You're just running circles inside a prison. And you can't escape and you can't win because this race has no finish line. Here's the deal. The world doesn't applaud character or integrity. The world applauds appearance and performance. That's what they clap for. Are you the prettiest? Did you win the most? Did you score the most touchdowns? Do you have the best grades? How many likes did you get? How many dates have you had? That's what we clap for. And I don't care how hard you're running. There is somebody behind you that is going to pass you someday. J.R. Vassar talked about going on a mission trip to Southeast Asia. And they went to this temple of this very famous Buddha a colossal statue. And he watched these people desperately poor, taking the very last of their money and putting it before this idol, hoping it would bring a blessing. And then he went around the back and there was scaffolding because the statue was falling apart and needed repair. And he thought to himself, how sad that broken people are coming to a broken Buddha asking the broken Buddha to fix their broken lives while somebody else is having to fix the broken Buddha. But then he thought, are we that different? Broken people constantly asking other broken people to tell me I'm okay so I can feel good about myself. It's bondage. And it's not worth it. To enter a race where other people determine your worth. Bondage. And it leads to significant spiritual damage. And here's why it'll destroy your relationship with God. Because you look over and over in the scriptures, and the people that often walked closest to God had to turn away from the applause of the crowd. They were often hated or chastised by the crowd. 
Paul has this verse in Galatians chapter 1 that is kind of one of my life verses. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. You see, free people live for an audience of one. Because there's only one whose measure of my value is going to bring me freedom. So let me share with you the single most important lesson God has ever taught me. And it's this. Instead of living my life for a blessing, what if I learned to live my life from a blessing? What if I learned to live my life out of what God has said about me? Instead of living my life constantly needing you to say something about me. Because here's the thing, somebody has already proved how much you're worth. Somebody has conferred worth on you before your performance or your appearance was ever even considered. Paul in Ephesians 1 puts it this way. Long before he laid down earth's foundations, God had us in mind and he had settled on us as the focus of his love. And when you live in bondage to what other people think about you, the blessing of knowing what God says about you is forfeited. But here's the thing, other people aren't um, qualified to tell you what you're worth. Only God is. I'll illustrate it like this. I have a teddy bear in my office. He is the world's ugliest teddy bear. His name is Tim. I don't know why, it's just what I named him when I was a little boy. Tim is an ugly bear. His nose is bent and broken. His eyes don't move anymore. He's got, all his fur is gone. He's got in the back lots of places where my mom has stitched him up and put the stuffing back inside. Tim is one ugly bear. It doesn't matter. Tim is mine. So it's my senior year in high school. My parents were going to move to another city. And they decided to have a garage sale. So I come home from school one day and there's all these tables out on the driveway with stuff on them. And there's Tim on a table with a post-it note, 25 cents. I picked Tim up. I went and found my mother. And for the only time in her life, I called her to public repentance. <laughs> and I made it very clear, Tim was never to be sold to anybody at any time for any price because his worth comes from the one who owns him and who loves him. And so does yours. That's where your worth comes from. God doesn't just proclaim your worth. God proves it. What does the scripture say in Romans 5? God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Now here's the thing. Right now, you are determining your value. Either based on how you see yourself in the eyes of others or how you see yourself in the eyes of God. And when you become convinced that you matter to God, it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. The love of God will crowd out the need to be applauded by the crowd. And when you know who you are, you also know who you don't 
have to try to be anymore. And you can leave the prison of other people's expectations. And it is so liberating to be so conscious of the approval of God that nobody else can tell you how to live or who to love. Because here's the big takeaway. Anybody freed by love can love anybody. Now, I'm going to give you a heads up. There's a big final coming. And there's two big questions going to be on it. Did you love God? And did you love people? And here's the thing. You cannot be a lover and a pleaser. Because applause is always conditional. Applause is never based on grace. You have to earn it. But when you leave that prison of people pleasing, you're free to give love, unearned, unconditional, undeserved. What does scripture say in 1 John 4? We love because he first loved us. When I get that, when I live in that, when I am set free by that, I am free to love you unconditionally. Not because I need something from you but because I have received something from God. I am free to finally, completely, genuinely love you. No strings attached. Because I'm not loving you to get anything from you. I'm loving you because I have received everything from God. And by the way, isn't that how Jesus lived? Do you know why Jesus could love everybody? Jesus didn't care what anybody thought. But Jesus, she's a street walker. Jesus, he's a tax collector. Jesus, you can't go touching him, he's a leper. Jesus didn't need the approval of the crowd. He had the approval of the Father. And he could love anybody because he didn't need anybody to tell him who he was. And you know what? We can be that free. That's one reason a moment ago you took some bread, you took a cup. What was that all about? We were remembering. Where do we find our value? Who tells us who we are? And what story are we going to live tomorrow? So let me fast forward to um, high school. For reasons I don't have time to go into my parents had to put me into school early, which meant I was always the youngest in my class. By the end of my ninth grade year, some of my friends were, had their driver's license. By the end of my sophomore year, all of my peers had turned 16 and got their driver's license. I start my junior year of high school, I'm still not 16. Now, that does not put you up high on the cool ladder. I was never high on the cool ladder anyway. But in high school, I wasn't at the bottom. That was Daryl. Daryl was the Connie of my high school. Daryl was socially awkward. Daryl was a nerd. I mean, Daryl literally wore the black glasses with the tape and had the pocket protector with the pins in it. And it was never out of bounds to pick on Daryl. Nobody stood up for Daryl. I want you to imagine 
you get on the bus to go to high school. And every single day before you even get to school, your self-esteem has been attacked and shattered. That was Daryl. Every day. You see what most people at school didn't know that I knew? Because Daryl lived about four houses up the street from me. Daryl's father was an alcoholic and a very angry man. More than once I would walk by his house in the evening and I would hear Daryl's father screaming at him. Probably more. Daryl's life at home was harder than his life at school and his life at school was hell. Well, anyway, through the fall of my junior year, I finally turned 16. I had saved up $600. I bought an old Chevy. It wasn't much, but it doesn't matter because everybody knows when you get your own car in high school, you just became a little bit more cool. And I had waited for this for so long. I am finally going to move up the ladder of cool a little bit. I'm at supper that night, the doorbell rings. I answer the door. It was Daryl. Rick, is that your car? Yeah, Daryl, that's my car. Are you going to take it to school tomorrow? Yes, I am. Can I have a ride? I'm not proud of this, but you know exactly what went through my mind. Give Daryl a ride? I have waited so long to finally be more cool? And now you want me to take the most unpopular kid in school? And then... I looked in Daryl's eyes and I realized Daryl wasn't asking me for a ride. Daryl was asking me for a rescue. Sure, Daryl. I'll give you a ride to school. And I did. Every day for the rest of the school year, I gave my friend Daryl a ride. I got to know him. A little strange, but really deep down, a nice guy. It did not move me up the ladder of cool. It did not get me invited to any hot parties to be known as Daryl's friend. But later that summer, I'm out in the backyard, and I hear something belching up the alley. And I look, and an old car stops, and Daryl gets out. Rick, I got a car. And I wanted you to be the first person to see it. I am... I didn't know anything back then about the Holy Spirit. All I can tell you is that for the first time in my life, I felt the tangible smile of God. You hear it? Listen close. Heaven is clapping for you. God is crazy about you. And you can walk in that freedom. Let me pray for us. So God, you are a good, good father. But it's hard for us 
to really believe that we are who you say we are. We listen to so many other voices. We check so many other devices. Help us today to accept at a level we've never accepted before the powerful truth that you have made it clear who we are, what we're worth, and that we were meant to walk in freedom. Help us to do this, God. Because the world needs so desperately to be loved genuinely. And we can't do that until we know we are genuinely loved. We pray all this for the sake, glory, and name of Jesus. Amen. Let me ask you to stand up, please. We're going to sing a song of praise. It's my understanding that there'll be a shepherd down front, perhaps another at the chapel area. I know they would love to receive you for prayer, to encourage you. And of course, we would love to welcome anyone who's ready to let God tell them who they are through the act of baptism. So would you please come while we worship. Who can satisfy my soul?